You ever have the feeling that your life has turned into some kind of TV show? That if you just turn around fast enough, you'll catch the people with the cameras and lights who are putting you through all this lunacy for their own entertainment? Well, Miss Dodd had that feeling in spades when she woke up this morning. God, same thing. Had you go in there, didn't we? No, this isn't the days and nights of Molly Dodd. That over there is the days and nights of Molly Dodd. This here is a show about how they make that show over there. Welcome to Quiet on the Set, behind the scenes of Molly Dodd. I'm Davy McQuinn, a former wire walker, vaudevillian, and private eye, uh, currently doorman and raconteur. And I'll be serving as your guide and mentor for the next half hour. Uh, we'll start out with my uniform, commanding your respect, but eventually my engaging personality will win your affection. Uh, along the way, I'll tell you about Miss Dodd and her world, a world which is a lot like the real one. People aren't perfect, they live messy lives, Sometimes funny things happen, sometimes sad. Nothing gets resolved very easily. And there's no laugh track whooping it up every time I tell one of my wry yet poignant jokes. As for Miss Dart herself, well, she's pretty funny. But she has her wistful moments, too. I mean, she's only human. Just a single woman in New York trying to make sense of a crazy world. Now, really big things are in store for her. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, my point is that the Days and Nights of Molly Dodd is a unique show. And in Quiet on the Set, behind the scenes of Molly Dodd, we'll go behind the proverbial scenes to show you why. Oh. TV in the past two decades. He's a talented guy. A creative guy. Oh, I pussyfoot around. The man is a genius. He's my boss. Jay, uh, could you spit out the gum and tell us where Molly came from? Um, Molly Dodd came from uh, my head and, and Blair's head, Blair Brown's head, and that just came from there. It came from my imagination. The idea for Molly Dodd actually came from a meeting uh, with Brandon Tartikoff of NBC and Jay Tarsus. And Brandon wanted Jay to write a series about the modern... American woman single in a large metropolitan area without saying the merry word. He wanted, he wanted that series again. Jay and I had done a thing called The Faculty together, a, a pilot for a series for ABC. It was one of several shows Jay's done with executive producer Bernie Brillstein. Before that, Jay worked on The Carol Burnett Show, The Bob Newhart Show, and a bunch of others that were canned uh, that you wouldn't remember. So Jay came to New York and we started to kick around ideas basically about what we didn't want Molly to be. We knew more of what we didn't like about television and about female characters than what we did want. So we started from that. So we would meet in various restaurants and places around New York and California and talk about ideas that we had, or, and I would throw, you know, ask Blair certain things about this, if she liked this. And we just, you know, noodle. Uh, that's a jazz term. Also, it's a cooking term. <laughs> I would say Jay is certainly much more like Molly. I, I bear physical resemblance that is closer to Molly's, but Jay is, in fact, the sort of heart and soul of Molly. Um, maybe he wants to be Molly. I'm not sure. She wishes she were Molly. She's lying. No, I envy her. I envy the fact that she seems to be able to float through life in a way that I, I for one, uh, just have to have a sort of plan and a plot. Okay, I was broke looking for work. But don't let anybody kid you. I had leads, plenty of them. Molly is a very um, flawed character in that she sometimes is a bit too stubborn. She sometimes has a bad temper. She can't quite make a commitment to either a job or a person in more traditional ways. And that the fact that she moves kind of sideways through our culture, that she's not real goal-oriented, I think is what's special and quite unique about her, actually, still. 
Uh, well, uh, this is just in case you need to do something with your pancreas. You just fill out this uh, convenient form. Somebody will come and get it. What does pancreas do, anyway? See, I, nobody knows, but whatever it is, you can spare it. What do I win if I give them everything? A Subaru. Oh. So why did yeah. you decide oh. to act in the show? Because who was going to say no? They don't say no. They didn't say no to any of those guys, like, you know, like Hitchcock would do it. Who's going to tell them no? They could say no. They did say no, a lot of people, but I said, I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. Mom, Dad, there's something I have to tell you. Well, you know, you can tell us anything. I'm gay. Well, I uh, guess that means you're not going to the prom. I'm going with Doug. The linebacker. Actually, he's the tight end. Jay has a, a really great sense of Molly. Jay created the character. He was, is and was the guiding force behind, behind all of this. Uh, there are other people who now know Molly. Jay calls it a show for people who can tie their own shoelaces better it's truthful it's honest yeah, it it's funny literate. It's, uh, it's literate it's a it's a show about a woman the way of, the ways of her life during the whole day of uh, what she does and goes to work and the, her uh, patronizing you know when she dreams and all that so more or less it's uh it's, you gotta watch this show really to find out so how do they put the days and nights of molly dodd together just follow this woman all over new york for half an hour and slap some jazzy music on the front and back Au contraire, mesdames et messieurs. The number of people, the number of hours, the amount of work needed to create each and every episode of this show, uh, the mind boggles. And that can get messy. So you may want to put on some old clothes for this part. Their great advantage is that we're all here again because we know how to do it uh, better. Um, so I think we can make up a lot of time this last year we were finding our way through. But also, we're going to have to cut the corners wherever we can and work as fast as we can to get this hunk of the schedule put together. So what we're going to do is uh, start at the top and, uh, and work our way through to the bottom. This is going to be the first scene that we shoot. And we're moving over into what is going to be Molly's apartment. I think they've tried to give um, some life to it of hers. It's got a lot of old molding details. It has a nice fireplace, things that, that uh, I would like to have in my apartment. Yeah, but at least your furniture is not rented. The idea is that she moved into this place um, 15, 16, 18 years ago, back when apartments like this on the Upper West Side were a steal. It wasn't the neighborhood you really wanted to move into at the time. Okay, so Miss Dodd's a pioneer. Hey, that's not her. Who's the redhead in bed? Good night. Nice work, Yeah. Oh, God, I love this job. <laughs> oh, yeah. The stand-in. Nope. Flat like that. Is it even close to interesting? I will. I have to go back to wardrobe just to get my yeah, stockings and shoes. Know. Okay, good. Yeah, just so you know. I try to put her in clothes that support her as a character. We wanted to have a sort of sense of Molly's art and her kind of creativity, but also sort of a sense of her um, her sense of herself as a person oh, yeah. and, and the changes she's, you know, going through in her life. So that something that, that I worked on very carefully with Blair. Hey. Hey. Let's get a rehearsal, hey. please. Love it. Love it. No more of these doll clothes. You're no. going for bright clothes. Oh, yes, that's and right. Then, uh, she'll say, Molly, get up. We're late. You'll pull it down. Realize where you are. Mama, and then see you again. Right. You give almost give a second because you were in the hospital bed a second ago. Right. Right, right. right. And she no. was dead. Sure. There. <laughs> Those two feet. Golly, off, thank you. Off. Yeah, this makes sense. <laughs> and actually, if you could, yeah. Uh, next one is there. Not very quiet now. Here we go. Action. Molly, get up. We're late. Cut. Okay. Uh, show 40, scene 1A, the teaser. We're in the pharmacy with, uh, this is our big special effects deal when Molly shoots out the back of the pharmacy. <laughs> Molly comes into a pharmacy and sticks it up. She's got a gun and she's dressed in her fabulous cat burglar outfit. And she sticks up the pharmacist for a 
five-minute home pregnancy test. And we decided yesterday we're going to use a revolver, a magnum. Was a question we had. Do you want a really, really long one? It should. Right. You know, when she reaches into her purse and pulls out a gun, it should keep coming. Like, <laughs> like you do need to get a reasonable size Bang, muzzle flash out. Studio, you'll, it'll be quarter or half. Right. Uh, quarter load. Yeah, quarter load. Quarter, quarter load. load. Yeah, if, it, if it's flash. not going to jam on that, quarter load is yeah. fine. Uh, I mean, in the real world, it probably would, but I don't think it matters. The thing you're going with the this magnum does that change? The effect of the what what we're what we're breaking. I mean, do we want to go bigger? No, with, no, with the we, we went through this with the special effects. Yeah. It's fine. This is it's going to take me a few minutes just to pull the doors and replace them, and that's exclusive of any rigging that has to happen to them. The rigging, will, according to JCR, <laughs> already has taken place. We talked a little bit about Molly's outfit for right, this, right, with the and you hit across your chest and stuff like that. She's a stylish cat. Oh, and how can I help you, sweetheart? It's and this pharmacist right? guy never comes from behind the counter. No. We only see him waste up. <laughs> it's going to be four, six shots all told, a revolver full, four in the direction of the pharmacy. Now, duck sucker. We feel we need a stunt for a SAG safety person with us. Well, you know, if, he, if he's know? squirrely about it, we could certainly, since we're going to be, when we shoot the things where, you know, we can probably just see his shoulders and things, we could have a double in there wearing a pharmacist jacket. Let's talk, talk to the guy. So we should blowing up a condom this way. We're blowing off a condom. The first shot will hit a condom display. And three shots behind her to take out the, the, the glass shells. <laughs> Have we gotten word on the extras where they can count backwards? No, uh, not yet. Count backwards from 100 by sevens before you even think of calling the cops. <laughs> Molly is cornered by the cops after she's ripped off the pharmacy. And she's caught in your classic film noir alley. Drop it, lady, or you dog me. <laughs> the film that they shot yesterday is in our cutting room the next day after 12 noon. The assistant then logs it into the machine, puts it in the machine, and Paul will start editing on it, you know, the same day in the afternoon. The first choice to be made is made by uh, us as far as putting what takes we feel should go together, and there's a lot of footage there to look at, so uh, the first choice made is, you know, has a lot to do with it. Now, they can change anything you do put in, but a lot of it, most of it stays. I'd say 80% of what you do stays in there without being changed much. <laughs> Lifetime is readying for a new season of Molly Dodd. About my condition, I'm still kind of keeping it to myself. So. You know, I don't think I really have to explain this. I am an adult. Say again. I'm pregnant! Ah! What if a person wasn't exactly sure who the father was? Say hello to your little bundle of joy, Miss Dodd. All new original episodes of Molly Dodd, premiering next. Stay tuned, only on Lifetime. For the, no, 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 strike that one. New York is the greatest city in the world, but it's not for the squeamish. You can count the number of shows produced in New York on one hand after an unfortunate accident with a bread knife. And, of course, Molly Dodd is one of them. Oh, sure, we could take the easy way out, shoot in L.A. with our palm trees outstretched, but Miss Dodd ain't the sort to take the easy way out. So, interiors and exteriors, we do it here. The city itself is sort of a character in, in the show. And the situation is very specific. I think it's very true to a, a lot of people living in New York. But I think the reason the show is popular out, outside New York is that those, those concerns are universal concerns. I think the whole thing about Molly is this is someone who's trying to make sense out of the world around her when the world I think to all of us at this point in time doesn't make a whole lot of sense New York seems to be the concentration of those things in the world uh, seem to be so extremely focused here uh, the amount of input is so great that it's the best place to show that kind of a of a sensibility trying to live life sort of in a way that makes sense in a world that doesn't.
everyone involved in there are new yorkers the people at the at the top the writers and most of the directors and so they know what to what to get to you know get that new york feeling across to the audience first shot is we'll do one of these we'll start off we'll look down then we'll come over we'll come over back here i think the what's unique about New York is that the level of hassle is much higher here than most other metropolitan areas, and that, of course, gives us great uh, dramatic feed. The show is very much informed by the theater, probably more so than most television shows. The theater is the is the greatest training for any other kind of work you want to do, television or movies, and I think that there's, um, there are great possibilities as a writer in, in, in writing for actors that are, that are so well trained. Who is it? It's me! I'm on my way to join Arthur and one of his very important business associates, Power Breakfast. You have any seltzer or light soap? Well, uh, sure, there's some soda in the fridge. Help yourself. The advantage of working with playwrights is that um, these are people that have generally not written a tremendous amount of television, so they don't fall into sort of the formulaic traps of some television shows. Just let me run into the bathroom. I hate using public facilities. Oh, no, wait, Mom, no, uh, you can't use the bathroom. Why not? It's dirty, I, it's filthy, it's, it's disease-ridden, it's got all these microbes and germs and bacteria. You, you don't want to go in there. I mean, trust me, you could pick up something. Is somebody in there? There's a lot of give and take, and we all kind of work the same way. It's just out of old habit. And it's a little bit like a repertory company here. We all know each other well. We feel easy with each other. And we just, uh, I think that's creatively very nourishing. I think that, that you find that in the writers and, and the actors, that they're just, um, people that come out of the theater tend to be interested in more levels of work. And it's a little less superficial and more quixotic. It's a little less commercial, of course. Um, it's a little more eccentric, I think, because of that. Molly Dodd, uh, she's, uh, she's a real New York girl. Well, Miss Dodd's been through a lot of changes these last few years. Hey, haven't we all? I used to be a crop duster. But this year could be her most momentous ever. I mean, with a blessed, if somewhat mystery-shrouded event coming up and all, things are bound to change. But the big question is, how are they going to change? And the corollary question is, what are you asking me for? I'm just the doorman. Ask those people. In this season, her building goes co-op, and she's in a quandary because she can't afford it. She doesn't know what to do. The writing's on the wall. We're going co-op. Oh, that's... They don't even go in co-op as long as I can remember. Oh, this is it, Miss Dodd, the real McCoy. D-Day, one month from tomorrow. Oh, great. That's a very New York phenomenon, but it has it has broader implications for people living anywhere about whether you're going to rent a place, whether you're going to buy a place and really put down roots. One thing that's interesting, this year we have the fantasies. The season we're about to begin, there is more of this uh, fantasy stuff than than elsewhere. One of the things that's fun about directing Molly Dodd is, is this surreal world that she inhabits, her point of view. So um, it's fun when you get the, the fantasy stuff. I kind of hate to give them away, but ahead of time, so this sort of fun thing, you see, the poodle skirt from the 50s. This is the hardest thing that I have ever had to say. Mother, Moss, Nathaniel, I'm... What is it, dear? I'm... Well, you know, I'm preg... Preg... Say again? I'm pregnant! Ah! I think part of it relates to the situation that Molly is in this year, that it's that it's um, that it's an, the extreme kind of situation where she jumps she jumps into different different fantasies as a way of dealing with, with what the situation is. It's always been Molly alone, Molly alone, Molly alone. Um, ultimately, no matter what happens, Molly's this very singular kind of alone presence. And I think this year we all decided that it was time that Molly was never alone again. Um, so maybe we've created the perfect relationship for Molly, which is the mother-child relationship. What if I am pregnant? There, there, that's it. That is the word. I've said it. 
I haven't told a soul. Now that I've said it out loud, it just sounds so definite. Whose idea was the baby? I think it was, um... Boy, you know, that's a tough one. Whose idea was the baby? I, I think it was something that Blair actually wanted to do, was the idea of, um, of going forward with it and being in a situation of a, of, um, a single parent. And so I think it probably started with Blair, but I don't, I don't really know, and it's part of the, the nature of how the show has evolved, that there were a lot of people involved in, in, um, in taking the show in that direction. It was important to me that we, that she become pregnant at some point and that she have the experience of a single mother, because that too seems to me to be given short shrift in our culture, and it's everywhere, you know, but it's really not very well represented in television or uh, magazines or writing, unless it's kind of a problem, like, you know, the problem of the single mother. Well, it's just different, different things you have to deal with. So I think we wanted to explore that. Uh, what if a person, a woman, uh, wasn't exactly sure who the father was? I mean, she had a very good idea, but she wasn't absolutely certain who he was. I bet there must be a very easy test to find that out, right? Well, I have a strong theory as to who the father is, but I'm going to wait and see. Well, it could be one of two people, and I'm not at liberty to tell you who it is right now, because I haven't seen the amnio. I don't suppose it would make any difference if one uh, uh, candidate happened to be black and the other white. The writers would be the people to ask about that question. <laughs> We don't know. <laughs> no, it's definitely this one person, or just maybe uh, another. See, I think I'm the father. I'm definitely not the father, however. Moss Hawthorne. I know, but I can't tell you. Actually hasn't been decided. Uh, we're going to put all the names in a hat. Pick one. I know who the father is. I don't have to. I know who the father is. And I'm not telling. Oh. So there you have it. Not as easy as it looks, huh? But we don't mind the hard work. Me, I'm grateful for the chance to make my small contribution. As we put in our long days here at the studio, laboring mightily to bring into your living room Miss Dodd's joys and sorrows, her trials and tribulations, her innermost secret thoughts and feelings, there's always one thought uppermost in my mind. Better her than me. Thanks for watching.